Hello and welcome to our In Conversation with series where we'll be talking to experts across the legal sector to discover the mindsets, behaviours, skills and digital tools that are needed to run a successful modern law firm. I'm Amy Bruce, host and marketing manager at Osprey Approach and today I'm joined by former chief executive and regional direct director of various top tier top 500 UK law firms and today is senior consultant at management consultancy and training business CPM21 Ian Hawkins welcome Ian and thank you so much for joining me hi Amy pleasure lovely to have you here so today we'll be discussing how law firms can build effective leadership teams We'll cover the solutions to the top challenges law firm leaders face today, how to improve employee engagement and what skills the law firm leaders of the future will require for success. So first, Ian, tell me a little bit more about your background experience that's led you to where you are today. OK, thanks, Amy. Uh, well, I'm a non-practicing solicitor. My legal career started a long time ago with a high street firm in Brighton in East Sussex, where I did my articles of clerkship. Um, just reflecting on those two years, it was a really happy time, very hands-on with clients, so I learned a lot. And when I qualified, I moved back to South Wales, and I joined an established practice, uh, Leo Apsey & Cohen, which is now part of the Slate from Gordon, and I became a claim and personal injury lawyer. You know, from a management perspective, I moved into, I, I moved into management, which to me was really all about organisation, uh, and eventually I became managing partner of the firm. And I was lucky, it was really built, I built a great team of individuals around me and together we were able to grow the firm significantly, um, positioning the business as a regional heavyweight across South Wales and the West Country. And we won quite a lot of awards along the way, having some, some fun, fun whilst doing it. Um, after 10 years as managing partner in Cardiff, uh, it was time for a change. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that the managing partner role should not be a job for life. So I moved on to new challenges and then in the next stage of my career, I became chief executive of three fantastic law firms over that 12 year period. And it was a real privilege to uh, help those firms at uh, various stages of their organizational development. And we had a lot of success and again, gained a huge amount of ex management experience. And I became regional director with what was then Gordon Dads. Um, and my job as regional director was to look after the Cardiff and the Bristol offices um, and also to help on the assimilation of a number of acquired law firms into the what became the Ince Gordon Dads portfolio. I, I stayed with Ince for three and a half years, but about 18 months ago, I left Ince and set up my own niche management consultancy and joined CPM21 as a senior consultant. So that, that's a, you know, a, a brief resume of... Uh, probably 30 years of my career or so. Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly why we've got you here today, to pick at your brains and find <laughs> that knowledge and experience and, and help share that knowledge to help run a successful modern law firm. And you touched on a few things there during your career, like building the right team, making sure that there's freshness and change about to make sure you know things are moving in the right direction which I'm sure we will um, expand upon moving forward in this conversation but I'd love to jump into some key takeaways obviously I hope the listeners stay for the duration of this webinar because there's going to be great best practices and top tips shared but just in case they need to run away and they can only hear three things from you Ian what are the top three lessons that you'd say you've learned looking back now in hindsight after running successful law firms and being in that leadership role oh yeah well hind hindsight is a fantastic thing isn't it <laughs> <laughs> lots of things I have learned uh, some good things and some things which have worked really well and some things which uh, which haven't worked obviously um I thought the first lesson I've learned really is about the importance of having a clear vision and strategy for your for your law firm. And uh, you know, though, for those of you who are familiar with my LinkedIn posts, you know that I bang on about this uh, an awful lot. I do tend to be a bit like a broken record, but that's because it's so important, Amy. Obviously, you know, law firms are businesses at the end of the day, so there needs to be clarity as to the vision um, and what the firm's objectives and goals are. And once you've got that, those plans need to be uh, um, reviewed and there needs to be regular check-ins uh, to make sure that progress is on track and you're not, you're not being thrown off track so that adjustments can be made. Um, you know, if, if, if a firm doesn't have a plan, uh, then uh, with clear objectives and milestones, then, then really all you're doing when you go into work each day is administering. You know, you're sort of not, uh, 
you know, driving the business forward. And in my experience, um, you know, sadly, there's not enough business planning taking place in law firms. Or if it is taking place, I you know, question the effectiveness of it. So, you know, if you think in terms of um, you know, the various kite marks uh, that are existence in the legal profession, the conveyancing quality system being one, um, you know, every conveyancing firm really must have a uh, the, the uh, CQS, otherwise they, they struggle to get on the lender panels. But currently there's no business planning requirement in the CQS standard. Uh, so chances are many conveyancing firms won't have a business plan. Uh, and that, that's against the backdrop of conveyancing being you know, cyclical in nature and uh, quite a risky business model to be in, in my view. Um, the, other, the other quality assurance gradings, Lexel, uh, the specialized quality mark, um, those uh, accreditations require a business plan. So chances so the chances are the law firms will have one. But... Um, you know, again, in my experience, that business plan would only see light to day once a year at audit time. And such plans are pretty much a waste of time because they never, ever get implemented. You know, it's so just words on a piece of paper, which is pretty much meaningless. So those are problems when it comes to having a plan and a strategy. The other thing I see um, sometimes with law firms is where the managing partner will have a plan as to the way forward. But the plan exists in his or her head and it hasn't been written down. And the, and the problem with that approach, Amy, is that it's it's difficult to explain that plan to the workforce, who, after all, are the ones who are going to have to implement the plan, um, and their part in delivering it and measuring progress against it. So that's another problem, I think, with um, with with business planning and your firms. And you know, unfortunately and sadly, the Gazette reports more and more on law firms going out of business, uh, and the subsequent uh, impact that that has on clients and the wider profession. So, you know, I, I really would like to see much greater emphasis, not only on business planning, so you know, more firms have a business plan, but also, you know, really stress testing the robustness of that business plan um, so that, you know, it is, it is um, going to help the, business, the firm grow uh, and become more uh, more successful. Yeah, that, that's a great first lesson, isn't it? And I think that's where everything starts. So it, it's, it pays to be number one is that you need to know where you're driving and where everyone's aiming towards to know firstly where you're going, but also if you're successful or not, to know what you're implementing is working and whether it's aligning with that strategy and that goal. So, yeah, brilliant, brilliant first lesson there. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, right. So second lesson I've learned, um, the need to create a positive culture throughout the firm. You know, culture is a huge topic, isn't it? But, um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely a, a glass half full person myself, you know. Um, and I think this, this issue of culture is very topical in law firms because, of course, the SRA have been talking fairly recently uh, that they intend to clamp down on those firms that exhibit a toxic culture, which uh, I would imagine is the exact opposite of a positive culture. Um, and funny enough, only yesterday um, I saw on LinkedIn a post from the Chartered Management Institute saying that a third of managers left their jobs because of a toxic culture, which was uh, quite a staggering statistic, really. And, uh, you know, I think that sort of supports the SRA's position in terms of paying much greater attention to the culture that exists in law firms and has been the case in the past. So, you know, changing the culture of a business isn't something that can happen overnight. So, you know, the question is, how do you create this positive culture throughout your firm? And I would say, you know, there's lots of moving parts to that is the first thing to say. But I'd, I'd probably identify four main elements to it, which I'll, which I'll run through briefly with you now. Um, the first element involves identifying the values of the business, of the firm. You know, the culture that exists within your law firm will come from the values. But a lot of law firms really haven't identified what their values are. Or if they have identified the values, then um, the, some of the senior leaders or the senior leaders may pay lip service to them. You know, it's, it's what, I, what I call the, well, that's okay for you. You can carry on doing that, but I'm going to just carry on doing my own thing, my own sweet way mentality. You know, and I've seen plenty of examples of that throughout my career, unfortunately. And the problem with that attitude when you're trying to embed values in a business is that staff will see through it in a flash. 
And they think, well, if you're not following it, why should I? And any hope you have of embedding the values at sea is really you know, dead in the water. You've got no chance. And another problem I see with, um, with values is you know, some firms have defined the values, but then their practices are inconsistent with them. So, for example, um, some firms will have, will say, you know, excellence in everything we do is one of our values, which is, which is you know, fantastic, great. But they then provide the, they, they don't provide the tools for the, for the, for the staff to, for the workforce to be able to deliver excellence. You know, maybe they have IT, which is slow, it breaks down and that sort of thing. So, you know, lawyers can't get their work out efficiently which of course is then inconsistent with the stated value of excellence in everything we do, they don't match up. But if that happens, I think, uh, you know, partners paying lip service to it or whether there is a, a non-alignment between the actual practice at the coal face and the value, then all it does, it just results in frustration and cynicism, which of course is counterproductive to the positive culture that you're trying to uh, promote within your business. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 clear that having that positive culture makes more impact on the performance of a business. I think that's more clear now than ever before. And like you said, the SRA uh, bringing those requirements in is clear to that. And yeah, set like you said about having a plan and a strategy, setting out those values is definitely the first point of call and making sure they're authentic. They have to be the reason why the leadership team and the whole firm are getting out of bed in the morning, they can't just be something that look potentially good on the website or look good for the piece of marketing. They have to be authentic. So, of course. Yeah, so that's so I think that's the first element of this creating this positive culture, which is so important in law firms. The second element, I would say, is, is about leadership, you know, being for the leaders in the firm to be authentic and positive. Um, you know, if you want to create a positive culture, which is so important, as I, as I argue, is so important, then, you know, you as the leader have got to radiate positivity to your workforce. And, and everything starts from the top when it comes to leadership. You know, to me, leadership is about being able to inspire and motivate people. You know, but I, I do recognize, of course, that doesn't come naturally to some people. Um, and the, but the good news is, of course, there's now lots of help out there with some really experienced and excellent people who can help with mentoring and coaching established and aspiring law firm leaders to really enhance their leadership skills. Yeah, le the leadership have to be the role models, don't they, of those values that you set in the first place. And 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 mood and behaviour is contagious. So like you said, if you're not radiating that positivity or you're stressed, that's going to radiate to your team. And I don't think that's going to be leading to a positive culture if that's the behaviour. Um, no, that's absolutely right. Um, the third element, I think, in terms of building this um, positive culture about is about really sharing information, being open with your staff, you know, and involving people, which again is something that uh, I'd like to think uh, I've practiced throughout my throughout my managerial career. So, um, you know, if you've got if you have a plan, which hopefully you have for your business, then make sure that you share it with your staff. You know, tell them what you're trying to achieve as a business. Be quite open with them about that, and um, and explain to them what you know what you're looking for from them by way of a contribution. How they can help you get, you know, get from A to B and further that further down the road. Um, you know, one of my one of my many mantras is um, in a law firm, the only thing that should be confidential is what people earn. You know, so share as much information as you can with staff. I think there is a it's not so bad now, but I think a few years ago, it was, you know, some people used to think, some law firm partners used to think that, you know, they'd, they'd keep everything confidential and, they, and um, everything was top secret. When you actually analyze it, it's, it's not really, you know, and if you if you are asking people to buy into something, you've got to explain to them what that is. <laughs> so share as much information as you possibly can and think about think about the means that you communicate with your, with your people as well, you know, and mix it up. So um, you can use different techniques. You know, I'm, I'm a great fan of the town hall meeting where everybody gets together, say once a quarter and reviews progress. That can be really good for morale and sharing information. Um, you know, um, managing partners, attend, inviting themselves to team meetings, you know, ask for a 10 minute slot. We can go along and talk to a team 
they really appreciate it and be really pleased to be able to get so close to you as one of the senior leaders in the business. Um, one-to-ones where necessary and written blogs, you know, where you can communicate, where you can get the message, the same consistent message out to everybody at the same time. You know, goodness knows how many blogs I wrote as chief executive and managing partner. It must be probably into the thousands, I would imagine. But every yeah. Thursday, I would write my blog ready for Friday morning for publishing on the firm's intranet. And it, and it became the way things that would, the way things were done within the business. It became part of the culture and embedded. And the feed the feedback that we used to get from the staff was always incredibly positive. You know, they really welcomed um, us being open and sharing information with them using that using that particular technique. I think that's a great tip to implement. I love that idea of rather than having meetings or updates or communications being super professional or super um structured or formatted but actually having more of a personal style blog and i think that sort of opens the curtains a little bit to understand what it means to be in the leadership role what it means to run a law firm how everyone's coming together i, I love that example uh ian what's your final point on building the positive culture yeah my final point really is about valuing all staff equally irrespective of their role or whatever respect respect of what they're doing in the firm uh, and again, this this can be a bit of a problem in the uh, in the legal profession. I'm not not sure whether it's such a problem, it's, it's such a big problem as it used to be. Um, you know, the, the the value we've talked earlier on about the values of the business, and the values apply to everyone um, in all staff in the business, irrespective of whatever job or department they work in. You know, it's, it's not the case that the values only apply to the lawyers or the fee they apply to everybody. Um, so you really do need to avoid a situation where anyone feels that they're less valued or second-class citizens. That was that was the expression I used to hear a lot years ago. I'm not so sure if it's if it's so prevalent now, particularly with the support on the support side of the business with the business support um, employees. Um, so you need to really avoid anybody feeling less valued or second second-class citizens. Um, and, and you know, and to my mind. As long as people are doing their jobs in accordance with the firm's values, then you really do need to be valuing people equally, irrespective of whatever their job is, whether they're a marketeer, whether they're a solicitor, whatever, whether they're sitting in the front of reception, you know, whatever they do, their role and their commitment and performance is valued. I think the the key part of building an effective culture in a workplace, whether that be a law firm or not, is teamwork. And that's that's the best way to get teamwork is appreciate the challenges that everyone faces and how everyone, you know, contributes to the overall goal. So I love that idea of making sure everyone feels part of that team and, and part of that moving forward. Um, what's your third lesson that you've learned uh, during your time? Well, third lesson um, is about making sure that you, as the leader, uh, deal with issues as and when they occur uh, and avoid the tendency to um, ignore them or sweep them under the carpet, whatever expression you want to, want to use. So, you know, as a law firm leader, it's, you know, you're not going to be able to have your finger on the pulse all the time, particularly with, you know, as the firm grows and you, you, know, you have more employees on the rest of it. So I think it's important for law firm leaders to have really good feedback mechanisms in place so that they are notified of things that are causing a problem and need to be fixed um, in time uh, and they don't blow up in your face uh, um, and can catch you by surprise. So how can that be achieved? Well, it can be achieved by sort of formal structures and it can be achieved in an informal way. Formal structures would be things like uh, formal staff surveys, uh, which I'm a big fan of. You know, once a quarter, these things are done online now. They can be done anonymously. So people you know, should have confidence in, in them saying what they really think. That's really important. And of course, you know, the results of those surveys can then be measured and you can actually see whether you're getting better or getting worse in particular issues. So that's really good. I'd encourage that. Staff suggestion schemes, I think, are very important and have a place. You know, uh, people at the call face. Um, and again, you know, it might not be a huge issue. But if you get lots of little things that can be improved, they add up to a big thing, you know. Um, so that's really important and reward people with 
you know, gift vouchers or whatever for suggesting making good suggestions. And then uh, the informal the informal feedback mechanisms would be things like you know an informal network uh, that a managing partner would have within the firm that they can be relied upon to feedback any issues that are causing frustration or demotivation and need to be fixed. So, you know, if you've got those things in place, the chances are that you're going to keep your finger on the pulse and, and be aware of issues that you need to be that need to be dealt with. And of course, once once you are aware of an issue, you've then got to deal with it. You know, you you have to grasp the nettle, how, um, however difficult yeah, it, it may be. You've got to grasp the nettle. And, um, you know, this, as, I, as I often say, you know, the soft option is always the wrong option or invariably the wrong option. Uh, and the soft option in this scenario would be really to you know, bury your head in the sand and do nothing and hope it goes away, which it won't. And of course, you know, if you do that, you only regret it because it comes back and will bite you on, on the bottom at a later stage. Uh, and you know, so don't really, don't underestimate the impact that sweeping things under the carpet can have on staff. It can really, really frustrate and demotivate them to such an extent where, you know, I've known people leave because of it. So you've got to deal with issues as and when they arise. Yeah, I think the idea of the feedback loop is crucial, but actually the most important part of that is then action in the feedback that you receive. And as part of that sort of continuous improvement loop, you're looking to make those 1% improvements. And like you said, it really could be the small things that actually over time have the biggest impact on the culture and the success of the firm as a whole. So, yeah, I think the actually act actioning the uh, suggestions that you get is the crucial part of that feedback loop. Yeah, absolutely. So, again, I've taken a bit of time to explain it, but, you know, in the, goodness knows the, the three decades or so that I've been involved in law firm management, <laughs> those are the three important things, I think, from the lessons I would pass on is, is the need to have a plan, communicate it, review it, and keep banging on about it to, to your workforce, creating, creating that positive culture within the firm. Um, and that really goes to the heart of that is about your values and valuing people equally. And then dealing with issues as they arise, because they will arise all the time. You've really got to keep on top of it and deal with it and not brush things under the, under the carpet. Yeah, well, we can't ignore those uh, decades of experience, can we? So thank you so much for uh, rounding up your top three lessons. They're, they're great takeaways for our uh, current law firm leaders. Thank you. Um, so you did mention about your LinkedIn and your content on there. And that's something I wanted to touch on because I really loved a post you recently did. So you recently commented on the 2023 NatWest financial survey and you referenced Carol's through the looking glass quote. So the quote you referenced was, my dear, here we must run as fast as we can just to stay in place. And if you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as fast as that. So in the survey, they predicted that incomes are set to rise, but profits are decreasing. And your recommendation um, so that firms can work smarter and progress forward was to spend more time on business thinking. So I just wanted to discuss what do you mean by business thinking and what does that involve for SMEs and how is that different to probably what you might see in your, your day to day? OK, well, it's, it's, you know, it's commonly what's commonly known really is spending time on the business, I mean, as opposed to spending time in the business. And it's an expression I use a lot with the uh, law firms that I'm helping at the moment. You know, it, unfortunately, most law firm owners don't spend enough time on the business. Um, they are usually, law firm owners are usually senior lawyers with busy caseloads. Uh, invariably, they're still the highest billers in their firms, so I have to work really hard on the tools, so, so to speak. Um, and thinking about cl the client's needs and meeting those needs is obviously top of their priority. So I fully understand why the problem arises. But, you know, being law firm owners, they also need to be thinking about their business. Sort of things like uh, the type of business, they, the type of, sorry, the type of clients that they aspire to serve. You know, one of my firms, we used to use an expression, how are we going to raise the watermark in terms of the, improving the quality of the client base? Um, the geographical and sector markets they want to operate in, they need to be thinking about that. They need to be thinking about the services they want to offer. Are we going to stick to the knitting? You know, what we've always offered traditionally, try and get better at that. Are we, do we think we can maybe offer another service that's got synergies with our core business? They need to be thinking about their people. 
um, the type of people they're going to need in the future to service their clients and the skills they need. Do we need more lawyers? Will they need to be solicitors? Should they be paralegals, for example? And they need to be thinking about the infrastructure of the business. You know, technology is key. What sort of technology are we going to use? Uh, are we going to need and use uh, an office space with the with the rise of hybrid working? Um, how much space do we need so that we you know we we don't uh, pay for excess space that we don't use? If we're going to be working in a hybrid way, how are we going to overcome the challenges of you know making sure that everybody feels part of the team, which is so important? So those are the sort of things that they need to be thinking about and preparing a plan. And of course, once they have a plan, as I've said earlier on, some law firms will have a plan because, you know, Lexal says they must. Um, but again, law firm leaders are very busy people, so they need to create uh, an environment where they regularly review and update their plans. Uh, and the world, the world I, I operate in, you know, is well used to a sort of quarterly rolling model whereby we sit down or I sit down each quarter with the management team of law firms and review progress on their financials and other goals and objectives that they've set and then we set new priorities for the coming quarter and then most importantly we then communicate those changes and what we've done back cascade that back down through the management structure of the business so that hopefully everybody's joined up in terms of where we are in terms of our in terms of our plan so you know it, it does require quite a bit of discipline amy in terms of making sure that you know you've got a plan in the first place and that you review it regularly um, and i think that's where really a third party consultant can certainly help managing partners in really instilling that structure and that discipline into the process so that it happens whether it's month in month out or quarter in quarter out and that things are being reviewed and moved forward so that's really what I mean, what I meant by uh, when, I, when I was doing the Alice through the looking glass. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a great point. And like you said, to be fair, you said in your intro, in your experience, you started off as a solicitor and you had a huge caseload. But as you moved up into leadership, it was a requirement that you reduce that because you need the time. Everybody needs the time to plan these things, execute these things. And if you're juggling a caseload, there's never going to be enough time in the day to get around to that That's right. absolutely um, yeah of course so it's, it's very clear from your recommendations and from the business thinking approach that a business requires a clear strategy and a vision and that that strategy is communicated and encouraged by the leadership team so that they can effectively engage their employees steer everybody in the right direction and drive the business forward so in your experience what do you believe are the top management or leadership challenges that firms will be facing right now? And what are the potential either solutions or things that they can implement to help avoid those challenges? Yes, OK. Well, like ever, there's there's no shortage of challenges, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the first point is context. Um, you know, law firms differ in size from sole practitioners to you know, multi-million pound businesses. And if you segment the law firm market, and there'd be lots of different layers, uh, I'm sure you'd find all your identified challenges that are particular to each segment. But, but that said, you know, there are challenges that are pretty much common to all law firms, uh, irrespective of size. Uh, you know, the extent and the cost of regulation is an issue for sure. You know, law firms having to spend more time dealing with regulatory issues that eat into fee earning time and you know, impact profitability. You know, that's that's a challenge, and it's a perception that you know it's just getting more and more demanding with each year. Um, you know, help help is available for law firms. Um, you know, the bigger firms probably have you know, dedicated risk departments, but lots of law firms can't afford that, of course. Uh, but help is available for those law firms. You know, who can buy in additional risk expertise uh, as and when required from specialist consultants um, you know such as CPM21 and there's others out there in the in the marketplace that can be a very cost effective solution to help with that challenge of the regulatory burden. Um, obtaining professional indemnity insurance uh, <laughs> that becomes a challenge for lots of firms uh, more of a challenge for lots of firms each year uh, particularly if you've got a you know if you've got a 
high percentage of your fees wrapped up in residential conveyancing, which the insurers consider to be quite risky. So, you know, those firms uh, that struggled with on the PII renewal, they really, really need to show good risk management practices, particularly around the supervision, close supervision of staff. That's, that's really important. Um, I'd say recruiting and retaining staff is, uh, is just as problematic as it's been for some time. Um, you know, and, and smaller firms, I think, from my experience, smaller firms really do feel at a disadvantage to larger firms because they perceive larger firms to have deeper pockets, you know, able to offer more money and all the rest of it. So what I would say to, to that is, you know, try to get as close to market related pay as possible, you know, and uh, offer as, as good a benefits package as you possibly can. But then it's all about to retain the staff. It's all about building engagement with the staff. You know, we're going to go on to talk about this uh, later in the webinar. But building engagement is so important uh, when it comes to retention. You know, so giving your staff decent quality work, involvement, responsibility, uh, and recognition and things like that are really important. Um, you know, competition, again, competition in the legal profession, it's, it's, as, it's, it's as fierce as it's ever been. Um, and it's competition not just from other law firms in the locality, but regional and national firms, and indeed non-law firms providing legal services. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it is tough. What, what can law firms do to try to give themselves a better, um, better chance of competing? Well, I think it's about, you know, understanding the market that you're in. Uh, I'm a great believer in... Um, what I call sticking to sticking to the knit or stick to the knitting, you know, focus on your core business uh, and try to get better and famous in, in that line of business rather than going off and trying to set up uh, all sorts of different service lines that you know you've got really no expertise or track record in, and and also listening to your clients that's really important. That's something I don't think, generally speaking, we do enough of in the legal profession. So you know. Go and see your clients, ask them what they think of your service, you know, ask them what you need to do for them to buy more services from you. Um, and if you, if you don't like, if you don't feel comfortable asking those questions, again, retain an experienced consultant to do it. Because in my experience, you know, the feedback that you get really could be worth its weight in gold to you as a business. Um, and then, you know, you might, you know, who knows, you might then uh, avoid having to run faster and faster each year, as we talked about earlier on, just to stand still. So those, I think, are the main challenges. There's, there's others, of course, but those are the main challenges, I, I would say. Yeah, and they all, I've got so many tabs open in my brain now to link back to what you've just said, but a couple of key things link back to the top takeaways that you mentioned right at the start. So you said about stick to the knitting that phrase of stick to what you know and and do it famously is that really link that to your values what have you said you're going to deliver and make sure you do it 100 percent every time so you use the example about excellence if that's one of your values how can you make sure you have excellence in every client touch point it's about getting to the nitty gritty isn't it and really making sure you're sweating the small stuff and and looking at all your operations so i think that's that's a brilliant uh takeaway there and similarly with the client feedback, you mentioned about getting your employee feedback, but actually getting it from your clients is just as crucial to make sure you're heading in the right direction, to make sure you know where to put your resource when you are looking to improve. And um, the third point I was going to mention was about the culture. So you you said about retaining client, uh, retaining employees, sorry, and that sometimes SMEs just cannot simply meet the salary expectations. But actually, if you've got the right environment and you've got the right values and you've got the right culture, that can speak volumes over salary sometimes because you spend majority of your day at work. And if it's not a happy place and a happy environment, then you're not going to produce your best work. So yeah, that they linked beautifully to your three outcomes uh, at the beginning. So you did recently join us on our Build Better Habits uh, episode to discuss being a data-driven law firm and how that impacts your long-term success. Um, within the episode, we did discuss the importance of having the right tech to access and store your data, and that you highlighted that um, 
having the right tech and the right digital tools actually empowers staff and improves engagement. Um, you referenced the study from Advanced that mentioned uh, schemes like bring your dog to work or free gym classes, etc. provide happiness. But actually, the real impact comes from engagement. So I just wanted to chat to you about what are the key barriers to true employee engagement and how can you um, improve upon that? Yes. OK, well, uh, yeah, that, that report I thought was uh, was fascinating. It was really, really good piece of work. Um, and I suppose you know, to start, really, you know, why is it important to have engaged employees? Does it matter? Well, it most definitely does, because research shows from that study that um, employee uh, that engaged employees, are the ones that work the hardest, they stay the longest with you. Uh, and you know what we know how much churn of staff costs in you know, direct cost and opportunity time cost in replacing them uh, and they perform the best uh, you know here's some statistics uh, companies with engaged employees outperform their in unengaged peers by over 200 you percent know, staggering um, so engagement really does impact upon productivity um, and therefore profitability and business success was important um, and it shouldn't just be something for the HR team. I think there is a tendency to think, you know, staff engagement, oh, oh that's something for the HR manager. Well, yes, it is. But it's, it's more than that because it should be something for every senior leader in the business because it has such an important relationship with the profitability of the business. But the sad, the sad and the staggering statistic is, is that, you know, unfortunately, only 11% of UK employees I'm not, not talking about just the legal profession, you know, this is all sorts of industries. Only 11% of UK employees say that they're engaged. So there's obviously a huge job of work to do for you know, the management uh, in the UK and the legal profession to improve this. Now, that, that, that sort of low level of engagement really was staggering to me. So, you know, how do you go about building employment? Well, you know, that, that study showed that initiatives such, such as um, you know yoga classes better coffee bring your dog to work all those sorts of things they, they, they they're great uh, and they tend to make employees feel better and all credit to the employers who are doing those sort of things but when it comes to building engagement um, the research shows that those initiatives only marginally impact uh, on engagement and it's the process of work that is the thing that really defines how people feel about their jobs. So, as you said earlier, Amy, things like, you know, providing staff with better IT, you know, people come into work because they, they, because they want to do a good job for their clients. They want to be able to get their work out. But, you know, if we provide them with hardware and software, it's actually more of a, a hindrance to getting, to getting their work out efficiently that's only going to result you know, in, in, in demotivated people. Um, sharing information and communicating openly with people, uh, with the workforce about the business and your plans, that's likely to build, uh, that's likely to build engagement and explaining how you know, the part that they can play in helping your business get from A to B uh, over a period of time. That, that sort of thing will help. Um, career development and career progression and transparent career progression because again, in my experience, you know, most people will want to get on and they'll want to know where the goalposts are. What have they got to achieve to do? What have they got to do? What are they got to achieve to get promotion within your business? So having a transparent uh, and fair career progression scheme is really, really important. And the last thing I'd say is about is recognition. You know, um, again, it's something that we're not very good at, generally speaking, in the legal profession. Um, is recognizing and rewarding good performance. So something as simple as, you know, saying well done and giving people a pat on the back when they've done a good job goes a heck of a long way to, um, you know, to, to improving and helping with engagement. Yeah, I think, you know, words such as purpose and value and transparency are all those things that really really mean uh, uh, better performance and engagement from employees rather than, like you said, just the benefits. They're lovely and they're great to have, but they're not necessarily the things that make people stick around. That's not the reason why you stay at a job. It might be the reason why you take one, but it's really that purposefulness and that we're in it as a team. We're moving together and we're achieving this together. 
um, and, and knowing your value within the team. I love that you said um, what part they play. I mean, that's that's all you want, isn't it, as a, as a team player, is what part do you play in the outcomes and the goals that we want to achieve? So, yeah, I love those takeaways. Um, obviously, um, common themes that we're chatting about here are engagement and communication and effective leadership. So I just wanted to touch on how can SMEs build an effective leadership team? Um, and perhaps it's better to start with what makes an effective leadership team. Perhaps that's the best place to start before we look at how to build one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, leadership is supremely important in, in all our firms. Um, you know, I've already talked about it this um, webinar, haven't I, in terms of the importance that lead, good leadership plays in terms of uh, building a positive culture in your business. And, and to me, leadership's about the the ability to motivate and inspire people. So in a law firm context, you know, again, in a law firm context, you really need to be creating or looking to create leaders at all levels of the business. You don't think in leaders just in terms of the, you know, the head home show, the one man or woman at the top of the business. You really need to be trying to create leaders at all levels of the business because that's really where you get the drive from in terms of moving the business forward. You know, so again, if you think in terms of your fee earning teams, you know, typically you've got your heads of department. So if you can get a head, head of department who's really motivated, who's really empowered to drive their teams forward, has the skill set, is given the information and the tools to do that. You know, they can really make great strides. And if the department is big enough, you know, they, there'll be a, a structure underneath that head of department with, you know, little sub departments within the main department. I call those sort of leaders pod leaders. It's exactly the same principle. You know, they may have three or four people who report into them. But again, if they can motivate and inspire those three or four people and deliver their part of the plan, and everybody's doing that, then the business is moving forward. And again, don't you know, we mustn't forget the support teams as well, because you want leaders in your support teams, depending on the size of the firm, obviously. You know, the, the head of accounts will be in a leadership position, whether he or she like knows it or likes it. Uh, that's undoubtedly the case. You know, you might have a head of marketing, head of HR and all the rest of it. You know, so again, they are leaders within your business. So it's really, really important. Um, you know, what makes a good leadership team? Um, I would say, again, this comes back to the having a plan and a vision. So the team really needs to have a plan and a vision that is that it's empowered to deliver with clear goals and objectives. I think um, communication is really important in terms of what makes a good leadership team, communicating effectively um, with the partnership, with the wider workforce within the firm, that's really important. And I would say, um, you know, also the third element in terms of what makes a good leadership team, being self-managed, uh, accountable and responsible for performance and results. Those are the sort of things that I would uh, I would say constitutes a good leadership team. Yeah, I love the word empowered. One of our habits in our Build Better Habit series is empower employees. And you mentioned earlier about having um, the team around you that can provide that feedback. And you're never going to get those trusted advisors and those trusted team if you're not empowering those individuals and those heads of department and those team leaders to drive their team and share the feedback back to you. So I think that's a great um, a great tip is to make sure you have leaders within the business, not, not just in that, that top leadership team. I think that's definitely key. And yeah, that word empowered is making, making sure everyone feels autonomous in, in their role and has the responsibility and the accountability to do what they feel is right, to perform at their best, to meet those top goals that, of course, are decided and communicated across the team. That's always crucial. That's the start point, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so from your experience and, uh, and knowledge, what is your advice for the current future leaders? So those people who are progressing right now or want to progress in the future, what's, what's your advice and recommendation to them? Oh, there's so many things I could say. <laughs> Resilience, I think, is is one, you know, you've got to be able to uh, brush yourself down, pick yourself up and get on with it when things don't go right, as as I very believe they, they know that's going to happen. But I, I've uh, I thought long and hard about this question, Amy, and I've, I've got four. I've got four points I want to make. Uh, the first, you won't, you won't be surprised to hear me say this, you know, the first thing, make sure you have a plan, okay? Mm -hmm. If 
got to have a plan, whatever it is, um, and then share it with everyone, communicate it until, you know, you're blue in the face and review it regularly. That's essential. So that's my first takeaway, okay? The second one to um, leaders in position and those aspiring to leadership positions, be authentic, you know, mm. live the values of your firm and try to be a role model as best you can. Okay. The danger of you not living the values is that staff will see through it in a jot um, and, uh, you know, your reputation will take a hit as a result of that. And be the optimistic leader. You know, if you want to be, if you want people to be positive, then you have to radiate positivity in order to take people with you. So that, that was my second point, the authenticity point. The third point, as I've said earlier on, is about feedback mechanisms within the firm. You know, you, you can't have your finger on the pulse all the time, but you do need to know what's going on so you're not taken by surprise by anything bubbling under the firm, which is causing frustration and resentment. You know, the, the, the risk is the leader, as the leader, you know, you've got your head on the vision and where you're going, um, and you think everybody's following you blindly, but that might not be the case. So you need to have that feedback mechanism. So you're making sure that you're taking everybody with you on the journey. And, and my final point in terms of advice I would give to uh, aspiring leaders really relates to the you know, one of the main leadership roles within law firms, and that's the managing partner role where I was for, for 10 plus years. You know, and I'm firmly of the view, as I said earlier, the managing partner role is not necessarily not necessarily a, a role for life. You know, there are some very successful managing partners who have done it, um, you know, virtually all their most of their career. But that's fairly unusual in my in my opinion. So the danger is, I think, if you if you withdraw from client work, you are likely to lose your legal skills uh, pretty quickly, uh, and you're following in your client base. So managing partners do need to think carefully about what they're going to do with their careers at the point in time when they're no longer managing partners. You know, are they mm -hmm. going to go back into a fee earning role or are they going to you know, pursue their career in, in some other way? It, it was easy for me because I wanted to continue with looking off the management circles, which I've which done you know, reasonably successfully ever since. But that's, uh, that, that is a, a point that, that managing partners need to be thinking ahead uh, to that situation so not taken by surprise yeah I think it's 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 looking to the future isn't it and having that long-term plan and making sure you're aware of what the responsibilities are of coming managing partner and what that means for you moving forward like you said you move away from that legal work and and what does that mean for you once you decide to move on and I think the key the, the point I really loved there was the authenticity point because I think what makes personally what makes a good leader generally even outside of the legal sector is vulnerability is to be able to put your hands up and say you don't know the answer but you're working together or to say that this is something new or you know something you've not tried before and just to be vulnerable because you know any sort of relationship whether that be professional or personal or in any setting that's the that's the best way to build connection and honesty and trust is that vulnerability so i love that point and i think that's a brilliant way to end the conversation and a great um inspiration for the future leaders of our of the legal sector and of our law firm so thank you so much ian for your um, knowledge today I, I appreciate you being an open book with us and helping us build effective leadership teams to run a successful modern law firm so thank you so much for your time today and yeah thanks Amy. it's been a pleasure thank you